Hi everybody, my name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. Today I want to show you how we built our extreme torsion box top assembly table. And it's so much more than just an assembly table. This acts as an outfeed table and even a full blown woodworking bench complete with storage. Since the day we started putting out videos, I was getting emails and questions from people as to how we built our old assembly table. I've got pictures of it in set there, and it's it was a torsion box top assembly table as well and served really nicely, but I never videoed the project. That was actually the second one we've ever done, so I thought I would create a new one, uh, the one that we just built here, that kind of is a multifunction table and serves a whole bunch of purposes, and uh, make a complete video of this and show this off. I also realized that not a lot of people have room for a project of this size, so we've actually designed it in three different sizes. Uh, this is an 8-foot version, there's also a 7-foot version, and a 6-foot version. It's also a unique project in the sense that it is upgradable. It is a project that has room for expansion. Uh, what a lot of people might do, for example, is start with the basic leg structure and just the torsion box top. You put this together and this is already a fully functional torsion box assembly table. And then down the road as time or uh, budget allows, you can add the next component which might be to input all of the shelves, the cabinetry that goes beneath it. And once you've done this, you have a considerably larger amount of room for storage. And this is a pretty easy thing to add to the existing torsion box top table. The shelves would actually be pretty handy as well for storage until you get to the point where you might want to make it into cabinets or possibly drawers, which is what I've done. And ultimately there are any other number of steps that you could take after that. You could uh, put uh, drawers in, you can add a bench vise to it, put some bench dog holes in, add some clamp racks at either end, and you can do any one of these things in stages. So the unique thing about this table is that it is expandable. It's a fully upgradable uh, tool for your workshop. You're not really stuck with having to build the whole thing all at once. You can do it in stages as your time or your finances permit. I also have complete and detailed 3D plans available for all three uh, torsion box top assembly table sizes available on my website and there's a link to those in the description below. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the build. This was actually a remarkably fun project to build. It was a little bit time consuming because there's a lot of components and I chose to do everything all at once. Uh, but the key is to start with the legs and what I did is I rough cut all of the pieces that I would need for the legs out of some cherry. Uh, you certainly don't have to use cherry. I'm using cherry because about two years ago I bought almost a thousand board feet for uh, two big kitchen jobs that I was doing and I only used about three quarters of it and since then I've been picking through the best pieces for projects and what I had left in my shed was uh, just kind of a bunch of junky stuff but uh, it worked fine for this so what you need is just a hardwood and uh, I cross cut it all to the approximate length that I need and then I jointed one edge and then we're going to take it over to the table saw and rip it to the right width. So the key is that I'm trying to build up a bunch of squares. That's what the leg frames are basically made of. They're, they're made of uh, squares so I'm essentially joining three pieces of wood so I've ripped it to about two and a quarter wide and when I join the three pieces together I'm going to end up with leg structures that are two and a quarter inches square. So I'm ripping them down here to that point. And the pieces that I had were a little bit thick. They were probably almost 7 eighths of an inch thick. I'm not really sure why. So I went ahead and surfaced them down uh, 2 3 quarters so that I can, uh, when I join them up, I'll have exactly my 2 and a quarter inch square. Uh, you don't have to be exactly that size. That's just uh, the size that I chose to go with. And finally, I'm going to go ahead here and cross cut them to uh, just about the exact width that I need for the project. And then I'll take them over and do my glue up. So 
So you'll probably see here that I'm not taking glue all the way to the ends and I'm actually going to join these legs together uh, with a joint that's called a bridle joint and you'll kind of see how this goes together. I'm going to take a little block of wood here that's the, the correct width and I'm going to space how far back I want that center board to be. This is just kind of an easy or maybe a cheating way uh, to make an end bridle joint so that I don't have to cut it later. Uh, one option would certainly be to go ahead and make the legs square uh, perfectly edge to edge and then cut that bridle joint out but I'm going to make the bridle joint by gluing it up in this fashion. So I'm sort of just proceeding in this fashion with getting each of these uh, leg components together, getting them spaced and just holding them together temporarily for a minute or so with my squeeze clamps until I have them all done. Then I will join them all together and clamp them very tightly with my parallel clamps and I'll let these dry overnight. If you can spend a minute or so getting rid of some of the excess glue now, uh, that'll make for an easier cleanup on the next day. All right, with those pieces done, then we're going to move over to do the, the center piece, the center components. These are also two and a quarter square. These don't uh, form any sort of a bridle joint. Uh, these are going to be brackets that go in the center of the leg. You'll kind of see how these go together when we do some assembly. Uh, they're going to hold that sheer web piece down the center, which kind of gives support to the two leg structures. And there they are. They're all glued up, and we'll let those sit overnight. So you probably noticed I'd never bothered to take the burns off or joint the edges of these, just, just the flat surfaces, because... Uh, before I glued up because what I'm going to do is after I clean this off is I'll go ahead and joint and plane all four edges to get down to nice clean wood. And that's a pretty quick operation. Once that is done, it is time to go ahead and start gluing these leg structures uh, into their final shape. And now I think you can see how these bridle joints go together. They'll actually add a whole lot of strength and rigidity to this structure. And like I said, as long as you're using any hardwood here, it's going to be fine. It doesn't have to be an expensive hardwood. Poplar is really cheap. Uh, sometimes local hardwood dealers have an, an off type of wood that uh, they get in on special, and you can pick it up for a buck or two a board foot. So that might be the way to go for something like this. And just in case you're new to the channel or you're wondering, that is exactly the right amount of glue for this project. I like to check everything for square before I put it aside to dry. And one of the nice things about uh, a bridle joint is that as, as long as you've cut everything square or built it square, uh, the final glue up usually always turns out nice and square. And finally, I'll add these clamps across the tops of all of these joints to kind of hold them together nice and snug for the glue up to dry. And I'm going to go ahead and let this set up overnight to dry as well. Okay, once that's dry, we'll go ahead and remove the clamps, and I'll go ahead and sand down all of the surfaces to get everything nice and flush in order to proceed from there. Next, I'll be cutting the vertical pieces that go in the middle of this leg structure. And these are the pieces that the shear web will mount to. The concept of using a sheer web is one that I borrowed from airplane wing construction. In a wing, there are spars that span the ribs all the way down the length, and adding a solid sheet to them from end to end essentially turns that structure into an I-beam. I realize it probably doesn't make a lot of sense at this point, 
but I think you'll see as this structure comes together how the concept works. So at this point I'm going to dry fit these pieces into place and make sure everything fits perfectly. The 3 quarter inch plywood spacer that goes between these two blocks is the exact size of the piece of shear web that's going to go in between those in the future. I don't think an absolutely perfect fit is required, but I wanted to get it as close as I could. These two blocks that will be mounted to the shear web will have to be fastened into this leg structure very strong, and so I'm going to use both glue and screws to hold them in place. I'm pre-drilling a little space for the head of the screw because I want it to go below the surface of the outside so it doesn't interfere with other joinery in the future. And once I sent the smaller bit in all the way through, I had a location marked at the end of the block where I needed to pre-drill that out in order to accept the screw that I'm putting in. And naturally I'm going to use a bunch of glue here. I like to have a lot of glue on both sides of the joint. I'll proceed to just put it back together exactly the way it was during the dry fit. And now for the screws. These are pretty serious screws. They are GRK structural screws number 12 by 5 and 5 eighths. These, are, these have a tremendous amount of strength and aren't going to break under any sort of loading that we could ever do to this. Now I'll clean up some of the excess glue here and set this aside. And there we have it, two fully complete leg structures. Now it's time to cut the piece of sheer web. I am using 3 quarter inch Baltic birch plywood here. Uh, Baltic birch certainly isn't necessary, it's just what I happen to have on hand for this project and so I'm using it, but any 3 quarter inch plywood would work great. I'm going to take some careful measurements and cross cut it to length. It's a little bit too big for me to put in my cross cut sled, so I'm going to go ahead and just set up my straight edge, my clamping straight edge, and cross cut it here. For the next step, I'll need to cut out four notches in order to get around the top and bottom members of the leg structure, and that will make sense in just a minute when we put it together. I like to cut it right up to the line and then come to a stop and finish the cut with a jigsaw so I have a nice clean cut without any overcutting. We're now going to do a dry fit of the shear web into the leg assemblies. You can probably see how the notches are going to make sense at this point. Our assembly table is actually upside down at this point. There is more of the shear web hanging below the bottom than there is at the top. The top of the shear web is flush with the top of the leg assembly. And so it looks like we have achieved a pretty good fit there. And so in essence, if you can see what's happened here, is we've sort of created an I-beam uh, with the web at the center and then the, kind of the tops and the bottom parts of the I-beam on either end. You can imagine that this is a structure that would never rack at this point. And we've pulled it back apart so that we can glue it up. We're going to apply a lot of glue to both surfaces of every joint and then reassemble it.
it was a little bit harder to reassemble than it was to dry fit it, uh, partially because the, the glue took up some thickness there, and we did have to pull out our long pipe clamps in order to draw it fully tight and closed. We're going to clean up some of the excess glue and you can see that the plywood shear web has come all the way to the outside of the leg assembly. One final thing we're going to do to maximize the strength is I'm going to go ahead and put four long deck screws all the way through. These are going to go uh, about a kind of single I think about an inch and we're going to put them all the way in uh, from one side to the other and that will positively lock this shear web in here permanently. Okay, we're ready to move on and make our feet. The feet are going to hold the casters and that's going to get this assembly elevated up off of the ground for us. I'm using another hardwood here for this part of the project and in this case I've chosen oak. I just happen to have a bunch of uh, shorter pieces of oak around and that's what I'm going to use for it. But you could use any hardwood. Uh, for this I also think that you could use uh, some three quarter inch plywood. You could laminate up uh, several pieces of three quarter inch plywood to give you the strength and thickness that you need to, to build the blocks. Oftentimes when I do a glue up like this I'll put a parallel clamp sideways to sort of keep the boards uh, square edge to edge and then I'll tighten them down along their thickness and then I can take that sideways clamp off and uh, finish clamping it fully. Lots of glue means lots of clamps, which of course means a really strong bond, and that's very important for these pieces. Okay, now that those are glued up, I think I'll let those sit overnight as well and work on something else until they dry. It's the next day. We're going to go ahead and pull the clamps off. I'm going to scrape the excess glue off and take it over to the jointer and joint it nice and smooth and square. Once it's done at the jointer, I will of course take it over to the table saw and rip the other side of this board so that it's parallel with the first side. You can probably see I have all different thicknesses of wood here. I was just trying to build up whatever I had to achieve the total thickness that I was looking for. From these two sets of glue ups, I need to get some rectangular blocks and some triangular blocks. And you'll see how that comes together here in just a second. I'll take them over to my chop saw and cut those out. So once again, if this is a project that you would like to build, I do have a comprehensive set of 3D plans. Uh, they are available in actually three different sizes for three different size uh, assembly tables. And they will include exact detailed measurements for every component of the build. Once my rectangular blocks are cut, I'll need to cut my triangular blocks, and I'm going to do those over on my crosscut sled. I basically have laid out the rectangular piece that I want at the angle that I want. Uh, since the groove in my crosscut sled tells me where the blade goes through, I've just lined up the two opposing corners directly over the center of that groove, so that when I crosscut across here, I should achieve uh, two perfect triangles. They should be exactly the same as one another.
and those look pretty good. This is the orientation that these are going to go in when they get attached to the leg assemblies. Uh, so my first step is to attach these things together, just like I've done there. Then of course the caster will fit here on the bottom of these things and you'll kind of see how it goes when, uh, when it all comes together. The first thing I need to do is kind of mark out where this caster goes because I'm going to have to send some long bolts through to hold the, the two wooden parts together and so I've traced out where the caster is in order to avoid it. Once again, I'm going to countersink the heads of the screws a little bit so they don't protrude through the surface. Then I did have to get a long drill bit in order to send it all the way through the bottom of the wheel plate into the diagonal piece so that I could get a mark for where I had to pre-drill that. Finally, I'm going to go ahead and glue it together and then screw it together. If you don't have an extra hand or a foot, in this case, to hold this thing together, then you might need to clamp these things down in order to securely screw them together. I'm using the same oversized screws here. I think they were uh, number 12 by 5 and 5 eighths, and that's going to have plenty of strength to hold this structure together for us. We will basically need to build one of these for each of the four casters. What this does for us is this gets the casters kind of up, over, and out of the way of where the cabinet is going to go. I'm planning on putting a cabinet, suspending a cabinet, underneath this torsion box top. And this, this assembly allows us to get the casters kind of off to the side and elevated a little bit. Uh, from where the bottom of the cabinet is. If I were to mount the casters on the bottom of the cabinet structure itself, then my cabinet would actually have to be much shallower. Since these are going to be elevated about four or five inches above the bottom of the cabinet, I, I kind of can give the maximum amount of depth, uh, height overall, I guess it were, to the cabinet itself. I think that'll also make a lot more sense as we progress a little bit more forward in the build. And so for the next step, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to pre-drill. I want to get the head of the bolt down below the surface a little bit. And we're going to pre-drill, and I'm going to use those same oversized screws to hold this on. I'm going to actually put three screws into the vertical uh, triangular piece, and I'm going to put three screws into the horizontal block. If you look at the GRK website, you can actually see that these screws have about 3,300 pounds of tensile strength and over 2,200 pounds of shear strength uh, per screw. So by putting six screws at each joint underneath the caster uh, is actually extreme overkill, maybe 15,000 pounds of strength for, for a caster that will never hold more than a few hundred pounds of weight, maybe 1,000 pounds if the entire table is extremely overloaded. So it, it certainly is built well. Uh, just in case anybody had any questions or concern about the about the strength of the screws or the strength of this assembly. Here I'm just spacing out that caster to get it into a, a nice neat location before I mark it and mark the holes for pre-drilling. Once I have those holes marked out and pre-drilled, I'm going to go ahead and screw the caster on. Uh, it's also critical that you use the same quality screws here uh, because this caster, you wouldn't want it to, to tweak sideways and, and snap off if you use a, a substandard screw. The screws here do need to be shorter uh, than the screws that we, we held the assembly together with, uh, but they're the same screws with the same shearing strength. 
So first I'm putting them in almost all the way down, getting the caster straight, and then finally tightening them all the way down. Then we just need to repeat that exact same assembly procedure with the blocks and the casters at each of the four corners of our leg assemblies. This is actually now complete. This is the fully finished uh, structural base component of the torsion box top assembly table. And this is probably a good point to pause for just a minute and talk about the project if you are going to build something like this in stages. From this point you would proceed and build the torsion box top. You could attach the torsion box top to this like so and then you really have a fully functional torsion box top assembly table. You would never need to do anything beyond this point if you didn't want to. Even the electrical at this point is an option. Uh, but this at least is a stage for you to get started. Uh, you can work this for six months, a year or even longer and then as your time or finances permit, as I mentioned earlier, you could add cabinetry, uh, do other things to fully flesh out the table and upgrade it. So we're going to move ahead at this point and go ahead to put the cabinets in. I'm going to rip the plywood down to the dimensions that I need for my cabinets and I'm going to take them after that to my crosscut sled and cut them square and to the right sizes. I like to put my cabinets together with pocket holes and I use the Craig pocket hole jig for that. This is a very convenient tool and allows for assembly of cabinets really fast. Uh, pocket holes are remarkably strong. I know they get a lot, a lot of bad press on YouTube and a lot of people say well that's not real woodworking and, and so on but they are actually tremendously strong. I've built kitchen cabinets for a long time, more than a decade. I've probably built 500 or even maybe a thousand kitchen cabinets and I use pocket hole screws for almost all of them. I've had uh, issues where I've had uh, a cabinet fall off the back of a truck going down the road and the cabinets that I've had that happened to that were made with pocket hole screw screws never broke apart. Uh, I have had other cabinets that were put together with dados and I've had those things fall apart just dropping them or installing them. So I prefer to use this method for assembly. Uh, in fact, it's also so fast that we were able to put both of these cabinets together in about half a day for this torsion box top assembly table. I'm certainly not trying to change anybody's mind on what kind of assembly you would like to use if you put cabinets together. I'm just kind of giving you my personal take on it, but if you like to do the, the dado and rabbit uh, joinery method, that's perfectly fine. If I build a, a carcass for a dresser drawer or some other fine woodworking, I of course use rabbit and dado and dovetails and a variety of other woodworking joinery methods. I wouldn't use pocket holes on fine furniture, but what we have here is a piece of shop furniture, so I think this is entirely appropriate. Uh, it's pretty straightforward how we assemble these. We just uh, basically hold the components together with clamps and put the pocket screws on and then just proceed to the next piece and go right through it in sequence like that. If you've never used a Craig pocket hole jig or if you have never used any of the tools we have here or you don't have them, I do uh, keep a complete list of all of the tools that I used for this particular build in the description at the bottom of the page so you can check that out if you're interested. So for attaching the back piece here, uh, I'm going to be using pocket screws on the side since we've already drilled those. And then for the top and bottom sections along the length, we'll probably just put screws directly in from the top. And that'll be a little bit quicker there. 
I have chosen three quarter inch ply for the back of this uh, structure. I want it to be pretty strong, my whole cabinet structure. I actually intend to use my uh, torsion box assembly table as a cart. Um, quite often I buy plywood if I've got a big project like a cabinet project, I'll buy it by the bunk. So, you know, 30 or 40 sheets of plywood and I'll wheel this whole assembly table right out to my driveway. I'll load the entire bunk of plywood on the cart, which can weigh three or four thousand pounds and wheel it back in. So I've put some heavy duty casters on and then I've just kind of built the, the cabinet structures and the other stuff uh, to just kind of assist in carrying those really heavy weights. And these are going to be the dividers uh, for the cabinet. We're going to be basically, uh, I'm going to have cabinets on either side. I'm ultimately going to put drawers in, but I do want the ones on the left and the ones on the right to be the same size. So I'm going to use some spacer blocks here that give me exactly uh, equal positioning so that when I actually make the drawers, the drawers they make for the left and for the right can all be identical and I don't have to you know, make individual drawer sizes for each size. It'll be each side. It'll be a little bit quicker to do this way since I can uh, cut them in bulk. And I've also set it up in this case so that the pocket screws are on the side opposite of the spacer blocks because when you drive those pocket screws in they tend to want to push that board forward and that way it'll run them up very tightly against the block instead of being pushed away from the block so when you're installing pocket screws if you can keep that in mind that'll make it a little bit easier for you I also think the manufacturer of the pocket screws, they recommend about every eight inches for pocket screws. And just me being who I am, I tend to like to double that. So I, I usually put mine about every four inches apart. Pocket screws aren't really that expensive. I think I probably spent an extra two or three dollars on the whole assembly table by doubling up the number of pocket screws that are required. Now I've got to turn my leg assembly over on its side and that allow me to drop that cabinet in on that side and begin to attach it. Ideally you'd cut it perfectly or possibly where the where the cabinet is maybe a sixteenth of an inch smaller so it goes in nice and snug but it goes in smoothly as well. And the next step after that would be just to attach the cabinet to the frame structure everywhere and to the shear web piece in the back as well. Now that the first side is done, we can go ahead and remove the clamps. The clamps I just used to hold it down into place real tightly before screwing it together. So we can just remove the clamps and we'll flip it all the way over, 180 degrees, and we can screw the cabinet into the other side. In this case, I've just built both cabinets on either side to be identical. If you were to tackle this project, you don't have to make them the same. You could certainly make them different if you like. Once again, I do have plans for this available on my website. There's a link in the description below, and they're available in three sizes. The big size, which is what I'm building, is a four foot by eight foot table. Then there's an intermediate size for a three and a half foot by seven foot table. And then there's a small size for a three foot by six foot table. So hopefully that range of sizes will accommodate everybody who might need them. And I also offer individualized help. We have a Facebook page called King's Fine Woodworking Community. I'll put a link to that below as well. And it's a group of about 3,000 woodworkers who, with varying experience levels, and we all help each other out. And I'm on there daily helping people with uh, projects that they build. So if you'd like to look us up there, you're welcome to do that and uh, join that group if you like. And that would wrap up phase two of the build. 
where we added cabinets to our base leg unit. And once we put the torsion box top on that, we have still a fully functional assembly table, but we've added some increased storage to it at this point. You could put some cabinet doors on it, or you could put a couple of shelves in and leave it open. The, the option is yours, and uh, up until the point maybe down the road where you decide to go full-blown and add the drawers and, and finish it out fully. I thought I'd show you the animation one more time with the torsion box top on, in this case here, so that you can see what it looks like at this stage. This is a perfectly acceptable stage to leave this project at. You can leave it like this forever, or you could leave it like this for six months or a year and come back to it in the future. Maybe put some drawers in, put some uh, clamp racks on the end, put on a bench vise, do whatever you like. It's fully expandable and upgradable. And that is going to wrap up the first part of this video. I hope you come back and join us for the second part where I'm going to show you how to make a perfectly flat torsion box top. Thanks for watching.